Good morning. Could I invite you to stand and let's join our hearts together in worship? Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing and shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise His name from the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise His name. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah. Amen. You can have a seat. If you're at home, I'm sure you're already seated. Welcome to Highland. If you're here, if you're at home, welcome to Highland. We're really glad to have you. And if you're interested in Highland, go to our website, highlandchurch.org slash connect, and we'll answer all your questions. So another treat today, Randy Harris is going to speak again on the book of Hebrews. And we're going to look today at Jesus being both fully God and fully human. Our worship theme today is the goodness of God. So I'd invite you to turn your attention to the screens at this moment. Nobody tells stories about sunny days when the weather was perfect and the wind was just right. Not good stories anyway. the stories we love, the skies grow dark, the waves leap high, a shark circle. We're never quite sure how the hero will survive. So why is it that when the dark days come our way, we worry that the story has gone wrong? Why do we declare that God is good when the sun shines? and then resist him just when we need him most. If he's already written our perfect, endless ending, is the writer trustworthy to get the middle one, to surprise us with his love one more time? Faith begins when we can't imagine what the next chapter holds. Did you hear the question in that video? Why do we declare that God is good when the sun shines and resist Him when we need Him the most? Well, some people may define the word good differently than others. But if all things aren't good, God still works all things together for the good. So evil in the world does not change the character of God. God is still stable, even when the world isn't. 
Let's stand and sing about the goodness of God. Well, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am.
say the Lord's Prayer together with Barrett Robertson. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. to heal me. I am weak, and I need your love to free me. O oh Lord, my rock, my strength in weakness, come rescue me. O oh Lord, you are my hope. Your promise never 
Success is a word which holds a lot of weight for me. More often for the worse than for the better, it's a way through which I take my temperature. How successful am I at X thing? That's how I determine how I'm doing. After all, who wants to experience a failure of the body or of the mind? Who desires disappointment? None of us. None of us set out intending to fail. If I could avoid the humanity part of being human, then I would. And yet, over and over, I'm completely struck by the fact that the more I try to be like God, the more I try to put myself in God's place, the less I end up actually being like him. Jesus didn't set out to succeed in the way that we define it. In fact, Jesus set out to do the opposite of what we intend. He set out to die. He laid himself, fear and all, at the cross. Over and over, I'm amazed by this. Over and over, I find myself humbled by it. Though he was perfect, Jesus didn't come for the purpose of being his best self or to help us feel better about ourselves and our failings. No, instead, Jesus came to intercede for us, to communicate the kingdom of heaven on earth and finally to die and to be resurrected, knowing that many people for a very long time would see this as complete and utter failure. And as we prepare to take communion together as the body of Christ at Highland, I encourage you to consider what the word self-emptying means in the context of God's great story. 
How do I empty myself of me? And in doing so, become more who God wants me to be. Let us as a church joyfully and gratefully consider how we might more gracefully approach this together. So if you'll prepare the body and the bread. The body of Christ. Now, for the cup. The blood of Christ. The Lord be with you. Sure.
Good morning, Highland. That seems to be a greeting with a much broader meaning than it used to, because not only are we gathered here in this building, but many of us have just finished a morning worship out at Festival Gardens. Many of our university students and others are just beginning a worship service at the Acre down on Austin Street. And many of us are viewing a live feed from the comfort of our own homes or someone else's home, or we'll be watching this later in the week from all over city of Abilene, all over the United States, and all over the rest of the earth. So for all of you, we welcome you in the name of Jesus, the Christ. The purpose of the Highland Church is to call all people to God. The God we call people to is most perfectly seen in Jesus Christ. Our task is to imitate him. We commit ourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit to be God's living expression of himself on this earth. As we join our Father in the restoration of all things, your continued generosity and sacrificial giving empower our ministries and efforts to restore Highland, to restore Abilene, and restore the world. Our giving is one of the ways in which we participate and share in the community of Highland. For those of you who are here this morning, I'll remind you that there are boxes on the walls as you exit for a physical contribution, and the slide on the screen shows all of us and reminds us of other ways in which we can share in our abundance. As the scripture of the Exodus begins, it opens with God's people crying out for rescue and for redemption. And that cry out comes from a Hebrew word, ze'eka, which means to cry out much in the same way that a woman would cry out in the anguish and the pain of childbirth. So as God's people cried out for redemption and rescue, God hears their cry. And as the people of Israel follow their God through the Sinai Peninsula over the next 40 years, they continue to cry out to Zeeka, and he hears them. And throughout history, as God's people cry out to him, he responds in his time in great power. In 2 Chronicles 7, at the dedication of the temple, God speaks directly to Solomon. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Each Sunday morning, we're given an opportunity to publicly bring our prayers to the Father. You may send your prayers by accessing highlandchurch.org forward slash prayer. And then throughout the days to come, these will become a part of the prayers of the Highland staff, the Highland elders, and a host of faithful warriors on our prayer team. So now we join in prayer. O oh, great love, thank you for living and loving in us and through us. May all that we do flow from our deep connection with you and all beings. Help us become a community that vulnerably shares each other's burdens and the weight of glory. Listen to our heart's longings for the healing of our world. We continue to plead for your presence in the midst of our physical, spiritual, and emotional pain. And we praise that you do have a plan with a purpose and acknowledge that you are still in control. Give us light in the darkness. We continue to ask for your shelter and guidance in all of our relationships with our friends, our families, and especially in our marriages. We cry out to you, Father, for redemption from the plagues of hate and racism and disease 
that continually threaten our relationships with you. And now, knowing that you are hearing us better than we're speaking, we offer these prayers in all the holy names of God. Amen. Tigarun ke imis tu suton e honte spericimenon imin nefos marturon, o con opothemeni panta ketin e farisaten amartian di upomenis trechon, ton pro himenon imin agona, aforontes in ton tispisteos archigon ketelioton, Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Reading scripture today from Hebrews 4, verse 14, through chapter 5, verse 10. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, and yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gift and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. We had a great time this morning uh, out at the park worshiping. It's great to worship with you and those of uh, you that are online. I was uh, talking to one of my friends from the Metroplex uh, this week who's kind of part of vulnerable populations. And I said, are you, are you keeping social distance? And he says, I'm keeping as much distance as the Dallas Cowboys defense. And, and I said, well... That sounds safe if you're staying that far away. That's, uh, that's pretty safe. So wherever you are, we hope you're well and safe. Uh, we're reading our way through the book of Hebrews. And one of the things that you discover about Hebrews is that it's repetitious. Um, it, it, it's like the Hebrews writer circles this point and circles this point and, and circles this point. And just to make sure you don't miss it, he just keeps circling the point. We also call that teaching freshmen. You know, same, same thing. You just, you just keep kind of, kind of coming at it. Uh, I feel like I've got a really strong ring in my mic. Can you uh, either turn me down or I'll switch? I don't know how that annoying that is to you but it's annoying to me um, um, 
And, and there's this long section in Hebrews about Jesus being our high priest. And it goes on for chapters and chapters. And I'm going to pick out one little section that you've heard read and see if I can say something meaningful about what it means to have Jesus uh, for a high priest. Uh, whenever you read uh, the Bible, you always read it in a context. <clears throat> uh, those of you who've been reading the same Bible, I mean the same physical Bible for years and years and years, and if you're one of those people who puts notes in your Bible, you find, probably find it interesting to go back and see how you read a certain passage 20 years before and wonder what you could have been thinking that would make you read it that way. And you're in a new context and you're hearing uh, the text in a new way. So as I'm reading these passages this week about the high priesthood of uh, Jesus, uh, I'm hearing them in the particular context that I am. And one of the things that, that keeps happening is that uh, even though I try to avoid them, uh, political ads keep floating by me. Uh, like when I'm doing something uh, very useful, like watching a football game, somehow a political ad will, will get in there. It almost makes you long for, for beer advertisements. Um, and... Um, I, I, I've learned something about um, how it is crucial if you're going to be a successful candidate today, you have to convince people this. I get it. I understand you. I get your situation. I get it. I get it. And I'm thinking to myself, no, you don't get it. And as I'm listening to these texts, the Hebrews writer just keeps trying to insist to us that God in Jesus Christ gets it. He gets it because Jesus has experienced in the flesh everything that you have, and none of those candidates may get it, but guess what? You have a God who gets it. Um, there is a um, there's a lure about having a priest. Uh, any of you come from a Catholic background? Any any? Do I have anybody here from a Catholic background? I'm never a Catholic when you need one. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, more than uh, most Christian traditions, um, Catholics have leaned into the meaning of priesthood, but the people that, um, that were written to by the Hebrews writer are mostly going to understand priesthood from a Jewish point of view. But they do have certain things in common, and that is the priest is the person who can help you deal with your sin problem. And I don't know about you, but for me, that's kind of appealing. You know, my sin is constantly with me, and if you could tell me there's a way where I could unload it and be done with it for a time, that sounds like a pretty good deal for me. And even if you told me it's just for a year, and this day and age, a year seems like an eternity unload my sins for a year and the Hebrews writer is going to tell us okay you have a priest who not only gets it but can take care of your sin problem for ever and that's why he's saying to these Jewish Christians you don't want to go backwards um, okay, so I'm going to do theology uh, for a minute. It's not going to be as bad as you think it is. Um, and I'm going to do a particular area of theology, which is called Christology. That's how do we think about Jesus. And one of the things that um, Christian 
uh, history has sort of demanded is that we confess that Jesus Christ is fully, completely holy God and is fully, completely holy human. And it is extraordinarily difficult to say both of those things at the same time. Completely this, completely this. And the Christian tradition has always struggled with how to say that. Um, and so I have this, I have this theory. Uh, as far as I can tell, no one holds to this theory but myself. So it's either my most original contribution or an utter eccentricity. Read it either way. Um, I sort of have this view that throughout his life, we view Jesus as fully God. And we have a hard time thinking of Jesus as human. Um, so a Jesus who would uh, get a stomach ache. Can you have a divine stomach ache? Jesus who sweats, a Jesus who defecates, and I'm not even doing the stuff that will really make you uneasy. All that makes us a little queasy, and so we tend to have this Jesus who walks about two feet off the ground, and he's kind of copacetically wandering through life, and nothing really gets him upset, and, and uh, he never stubs his toe, and, you know, it's, that's, that's who he is. And then we get to the death of Jesus and all that becomes very uncomfortable because we don't know how to talk about the death of Jesus except in human terms. So I'll talk about the torture and the pain and the physical abuse of the man Jesus and now he becomes fully human but he's not really God anymore because I don't have the vaguest notion about how to talk about the death of God. In fact, that idea probably made you squirm a little bit. So I've got this Jesus who's mostly God, not fully human through his life, and then I've got this Jesus who's fully human but not really God in his death. But the Christian position is he's both all the time. He's fully human through his life. He's fully God at the moment of his death. And that leads the Hebrew writer to say what I think is one of the most extraordinary things uh, that's found anywhere in Scripture about Jesus. Um, I cannot tell you how much time I have spent pondering these few verses because they are so ponderable. Chapter 5, I want to read them one more time, beginning with verse 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. Pause. Okay, when I just read that passage, here's Jesus with supplications and tears, pleading with the one who can save him from death. What are you immediately thinking in your mind? You can yell it out. Gethsemane, of course you are. It, it, it sounds like a virtual description. Of, I, I heard you, by the way, out there in TV land too. Gethsemane. It's, it, it's, it's practically a description of the garden scene. And then he goes on. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. He was heard. Wait a minute. I remember that story. I think he dies. And yet the passage says he pleaded with God and he was heard. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. 
And again, it's a, it's a, it's a mind-blowing passage. The Son of God learned obedience. He learned? Yes, he learned obedience. The reason he learned obedience is because the only way you can learn obedience is by obeying. There is no such thing as theoretical obedience. You show me somebody who's theoretically obedient and I will show you a disobedient person. Obedience is only and always in the doing. You don't know whether you're obedient or not except in the moment of obedience. And so we're told that the Son of God learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Uh, feel free not to ask me about that part. Jesus gets it. He's one who in his life learned obedience. And he did it from what he suffered. And no matter what you're going through, God can say in Jesus Christ, with great confidence, I get it. I get it. And that's the kind of priest you want. A priest who can deal with your sin problem for all eternity, who learned obedience the hard way through what he suffered. Um, I, uh, I will let you in on the secret on what preachers do on Sunday night. I've talked to a lot of them. Some of them drink. Some of them think about jumping off a bridge. Um, some of them crawl into a deep, dark depression. Some of them watch TV and try to not think about anything because Sunday nights are the worst time in the life of any preacher because that's the moment when it comes crawling over the top of you the gap between the gospel you preached and the person you are and it is almost un bearable and the ones who make it make it because they know they have a high priest who gets it who cried out to God and guess what died anyway they have a priest who gets it Um, one of the great things about the many great things about the life I've gotten to lead is that occasionally people will invite you onto the holy ground of their suffering or even the holier ground of their sin and those are often extraordinarily painful moments and a few times I have said to that person, okay, you need to know something. I will never leave your side. Most of you have had somebody say that to you at some point and you know how that feels. Now I want you to get a load of this. God in Jesus Christ as your high priest looks at you and says I will never leave your side how does that feel 
It makes you wonder how, as the Hebrews writer writes this book, trying to encourage, I think, some Jewish Christians not to return to Judaism, why they would even think of that. Well, I suppose there's this lure of the priest who says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to physically and, and, and deal with your sin problem in a way that you can see, and we're going to get it all taken care of for a year. And, and the Hebrew writer says, I have a different mystical high priest for you after that mysterious person in the Old Testament Melchizedek who who doesn't do things like your old priests do but you need to know this he learned obedience by the things that he suffered and now he's an eternal high priest making the case for you before God and he will never leave your side Uh, my guess is Uh, a number of us are going to need that word in the days ahead. Uh, Would you stand? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. To him who is able to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore, world without end. Amen.
Try 